Welcome to episode 171 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Gravity Goldberg on how you can teach like yourself. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript or find our new Truth For Teachers podcast community on Facebook. You can share your thoughts on the show there and reflect with other listeners in our private group. A big thanks to Advancement Courses for sponsoring today's show. Advancement Courses offers over 200 online PD courses in 19 different subject areas for graduate credit and CEUs for K-12 teachers. And right now, they're donating 10% of every purchase to fund Donors Choose Projects. You can submit your Donors Choose Project to them for a chance to get funded until September 27th. To learn more, visit advancementcourses.com truth. My guest today was introduced to me by a podcast listener who thought that there was a lot of similarity between Dr. Gravity Goldberg's work and my own. So I looked her up and I am so grateful for that introduction because she is my people. So many of the messages that I'm passionate about pushing out into the educational world are the same things that Gravity is saying too. If you are not familiar with her work, Gravity is an educational consultant and an author. Her work ranges from demonstrating lessons and leading workshops to developing curriculum and customizing professional development programs. She was a staff developer at Teachers College Reading and Writing Project and an assistant professor of education at Iona College, where she was awarded the Excellence in Teaching honor. So she's the author of multiple literacy texts published by Corwin and Heinemann, and her most recent book, which we're going to be talking about today, is called Teach Like Yourself. How Authentic Teaching Transforms Our Students and Ourselves. Let's get started. So I want to start with the subheading from your book that stood out to me the most because I don't think I've ever seen it in a book for teachers before. And that it's this, remember there is nothing to fix. I think this principle really underscores the advice that you give and teach like yourself. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. Um, so... I think that I grew up in the era of self-help books <laughs> that were really mm-hmm. big in the 80s and 90s. And I remember watching um, like my parents and my mom's friends, like reading self-help books. And I think the equivalent of that in teaching is this idea that um, there's something wrong with us or something missing from us that we would need to go and, and sort of fix to be the better teacher. And the idea behind that is simply that teachers need training to fix deficits or teachers need some outsider or a policy or a program. And in my now 20 years of experience and a lot of research and working with teachers, I realized that's actually one of the biggest myths that gets in the way from teachers being able to show up as themselves and be their best versions of themselves. The idea that there's something wrong or broken that needs to be fixed, like that belief alone really gets in the way um, of a lot of courageous teaching. So instead, what if we started from a place of curiosity and discovery and realizing there's always more to learn, there's always more to study, um, but we can sort of own our gifts and talents and try to build from the strengths as opposed to thinking there's something broken that we need to fix. And so I feel like my work with teachers is often changing our mindset around that belief And once we can believe that we're already whole and there's nothing broken, then we don't need to sort of help ourselves or read self-help books, but we can go on professional studies and we can coach ourselves and we can be with colleagues and and really see it as a joyful learning opportunity as opposed to the the often mentality of like, am I doing it right? That and am I doing it right is often because we think there is a right um, that we're living towards. So I really encourage teachers, if you notice that you're viewing yourself through the lens of something that that needs to be fixed or something that's broken, to start there. Um, I've never, ever met a teacher that was broken. (laughs) I've only ever met teachers who maybe weren't sometimes able to see their own gifts and talents. You know, as you're talking, I can't help but think also how this whole mentality trickles down to the way that we see students Mm -hmm. and the deficit lens there and this idea that there's something wrong with kids if they're reading below grade level or something we have Mm -hmm. to fix in them as well. And and I think that, that seeing in yourself that there is nothing wrong with you 
you are not broken and you have nothing to fix. Once you could understand that and you show up in the classroom as a whole healed person, it transforms the way that you see your students too. Do you think that's true? Yes. And I actually, for me, like the sort of doorway was through my students. And so I think I didn't come to that realization about myself as a teacher or the teachers I get to work with now until I started to realize that about students. So I wrote a book called Mindsets and Moves, which is all about the mindset that we carry about our students. And and there I call it having an admiring lens. And I use the word admire sort of counteract that deficit thinking you're talking about. Um, because admire, actually, when you look at the etymology of that word, means to study with wonder and awe. And mm, to me, I love that. <laughs> yeah, and my, my, I have to say, it, my husband's one who introduced that term in that way to me, and he's a teacher also. And and you know, I think just what would it be like? And sort of my vision of of the kind of educational landscape I'd love to see would be all the humans, the kids, and the adults are studied with wonder and awe, as opposed to you know, looking at them as numbers or data points or things that need to be fixed. And so, yes, there's such a huge um, parallel between the way we view our students and the way we view ourselves. And we can start in either place. But for me, the goal is, is to view all of us in that same way. There are three shifts that you mention in the book that help us teach more like ourselves. And they are shifting from being interesting to being interested shifting from predicting failure to building on success, and shifting from their challenge to my challenge. I think these are really interesting concepts and really powerful. So I'm wondering if we can unpack each of those a little bit. Sure. So um, those three shifts were really, so the Teach Like Yourself book is really in some ways part memoir because I'm sort of exposing my own journey as a teacher. And yet I also chose to share the parts that um, in my day-to-day work, I work with teachers almost every day in their classrooms for the past 15 years. So it's also these shifts that I saw teachers starting to do when they showed up more fully as themselves. So this idea of shifting from being interesting to being interested is something that especially I felt like my secondary colleagues um, were judging themselves on, like, could they hold the attention of Mm -hmm. their students by being really interesting? And to me, this is sort of the like edutainment in its worst. <laughs> this is yes. the like being gimmicky, um, you know, being racy sometimes, even with older students or flashy or feeling like you need to put a screen in front of kids or some just like outrageous content. And the thing about that is one, it's unsustainable as a teacher, like the amount of energy you're putting in for the small amount of like um, learning that kids are doing is often not worth it. But also, I think it's actually, in some ways, insulting to students, because what we're saying is that our need to be interesting is more important than our need to be interested in you as a student. And when I started instead to say, the way I'm going to engage students is to be a better listener, not to talk more in a faster, more exciting way. And I'm going to ask questions of them to get to know them and really figure out, like, what is motivating them and how can I bring that into the classroom I also realized that's what teachers are looking for. We're all looking for someone to be interested in the things that we're passionate about. So for those teachers who are feeling totally exhausted or that the bar is so high for what it means to even keep um, kids' interest these days, it's really a shift to saying instead, what can I learn about them to incorporate that in the classroom as a way to engage students? Um, The second one, um, shifting from predicting failure to building on success. I recently had the privilege of hearing Cornelius Minor um, speak, um, and Cornelius and I both came out of the lineage of Teachers College and the Reading and Writing Project, and he's brilliant. um, For those listeners who don't know his work, I highly, highly recommend it. He is. Yes, I had him on the show last season. He's fantastic. Yes. And he he talks about it in a slightly different way than I do. And then I realize also our colleague, um, Christy Mraz, talks about it. So we're, there's lots of people talking about this in slightly different ways. And I just want to say that because whenever I see that pattern, I realize like this is a really big trend. Mm-hmm. And so the idea of this is like really from a sort of a psychological perspective, um, we know that what we believe our kids can or can't do, our our expectations is what they will reach. And that's been proven time and time again in lots of studies, that if we believe our kids are going to fail or can't do something, then we're going to be right. And that's, you know, the unfortunate reality of that. But the other thing that I see sometimes is teachers who are 
to be quite frank, often just totally exhausted and not sure what to do next and not being supported enough in their schools. And when I bring an idea or when I share a resource um, with them, the immediate reaction is sometimes, well, my kids can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that mentality is we're already predicting the failure before we even give kids the opportunity to try. And so instead of going right to what they can't do, instead to think about the last time my students had success, what did we do and how can we use that to like bridge from where they are today to this thing that I think is going to be really hard for them. And so I really, really have started to speak up in the best interest of students that when I hear any statement about what kids can't do before they've even tried to point that out, that we're really just predicting. (laughs) Like there's no truth yet in that. It's just a prediction. And our predictions when we read books can be wrong and our predictions about kids are often wrong. So it's really a shift of recognizing when we're predicting and not using that as our planning, but instead to use the last success to help us plan for what students are ready for. Um, and then the, the third one that you talked about um, that's in the book is shifting from their challenge to my challenge. And this one, I think, um, is in some ways like a semantics of language, but it's also a really bigger than that. So when students are facing a challenge, um, there's lots of different ways we talk about that. We talk about it often in schools with deficit thinking, like you mentioned earlier. We talk about students who can and can't. Um, in our worst moments, I would say we label students like low and high, none of which are helpful um, because I know as a mom, I would never want my child uh, labeled in that way. Um, and so really, whenever we're talking about kids through labels or um, if we're talking about kids as strugglers or striving or whatever term we're using, instead of talking about it in terms of like, what's the challenge the student is having, we can also, it's not always in, a, in place of, but we can also look to ourselves and say, what's the challenge I'm having in teaching this student or these students? And to take ownership for the fact that like, our students are going to come in with a wide variety of experiences and a wide variety of gifts and a wide variety of challenges, just like us adults. And really, there's nothing we can do to change who those students are, nor should we be trying to But what we can do is take a hard look at ourselves and maybe even a soft look doesn't have to be hard, I should say, and Mm -hmm. say, what's the challenge in that for me? So I remember one year I had 27 third graders and 19 of them were very physically active boys who did not want to sit for 45 minutes and read every day like the expectation was. So I could spend every day complaining about how challenging these kids were, or I could say like, What's the challenge in this for me as a teacher? Like, what is it that I can learn or what is it that I can address to help this be less of a challenge for them? And as soon as I made that shift, I felt like there was hope and there was more for me to study. And I got curious and I got excited (laughs) and that year totally changed. And so I think part of it is just like, it's not just good for kids. It's helpful for us teachers to acknowledge the challenge for ourselves because that's where we can learn and grow and see there's another way our classrooms could go. I I like your point there about how it's so much more empowering and exciting for you as a teacher when you're able to reframe things in ways that make you feel like you have more control. And I think that personal power is a, is a theme that I see a lot in your work. Um, You recommend that everyday teachers make a conscious and intentional effort to tap into that power. Can you talk about some different methods for doing that? Sure. So um, I think first, I just want to even be really clear on what I mean by personal power, because as I've been getting to talk with teachers around the country recently, a lot of um, teachers, I think, rightly so, are like kind of confused by that. Like, what do you mean personal power? So um, power has been written about by lots of people. And the person I draw upon the most um, in the book is Amy Cuddy. And she talks about the idea of like, really, and this is also to be honest, sort of like a Buddhist philosophy, too, but the idea of the only real power you have is the power over yourself, that you really don't have power over others. Um, And another way that I kind of think about it is Byron Katie says it this way. She says, there's three kinds of business. There's my business, your business, and God's business. And we get into issues when we confuse the three. And so I think there's just this idea of like, personal power is really the only true power. It's my business. It's how I'm going to show up every day. 
what's my mindset? What are the choices I'm going to make? And are they really aligned with the kind of person that I want to be in the world? And so if we can sort of let go of the power we don't have, like we don't have the power to choose our students, we don't have the power to choose their parents, we don't have the power to make the school budget, we don't have the power to choose our curricular resources in a lot of places, or the weather, or the day the tests are given, or if the tests are given, and we don't even have the power to decide when we go to the bathroom in some cases, right? Like not to focus on that kind of power, but to focus on our own. Mm -hmm. And what Amy Cuddy's research has shown is that that personal power actually is more powerful. And so when we view ourselves as victims or powerless, that plays out by creating anxiety. And her research has actually, and her team has studied this cycle where when we're feeling anxious, we feel less powerful, but it's reciprocal. When we feel less powerful, we become anxious. And the result of that is that we become self-focused and literally cannot focus on other people around us. And I see this a lot. And to be honest, I've had these moments many a time in my career as a teacher where, for example, I might be being observed by someone who I don't feel totally comfortable with, or there's people in my classrooms that feel threatening to me for whatever reason, and I get anxious, and that anxious makes me feel powerless, and then being powerless makes me so focused on myself and what I'm saying, I'm literally missing the other humans, the students in the room, <laughs> and missing the cues of what they need. And so the antidote to this is not waiting for a district mandate to give us power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Luckily, it's not that. Instead, um, she talks about the fact that what we focus on and how we talk to ourselves and what we fill ourselves up with is where we create that personal power. And the favorite one of mine, because it takes 30 seconds or less and is free and no one needs to give you permission for it, is to visualize, she calls it priming yourself for feeling personal power. And the way you prime yourself is to visualize a time in your life when you felt powerful. And to just take 30 seconds, that's all it takes. I often close my eyes, but you don't even have to, to visualize and like imagine and envision yourself in a time when you felt powerful. And by priming your brain in that way, you're actually retraining your brain to feel powerful instead of to look for places where you're powerless. And she said people often say to her, like, how could that actually work, right? Like, how could just visualizing for 30 seconds a powerful moment actually do anything? And she said, well, think about what happens when we do the opposite. Instead, mm -hmm. before something, if we picture a time things didn't go well and we go into negative self-talk, we're already in an anxious state. So instead of waiting and saying, like, by chance, how's today going to go? Starting every day, whether it's the drive into work, whether it's while the kids are coming in, whether it's with the kids. I often suggest teaching students this. And as part of your morning routine, before you do anything else, you all take a moment, students and teachers, to have this priming of your brain for personally, um, for feeling personally powerful. Um, so that's one, and I'll just quickly mention, she talks about having a mantra so that you talk to yourself in positive ways. So whether it's like a lot of, as an athlete, but also as a teacher, I often find myself just saying to myself, like, I've got this, right? Like, I can do this. Um, also, like another one I have is I actually, it's literally tattooed on my wrist. It says, be here now. So when I start to get anxious about what could happen, just be here right now. So having some mantras there. Um, so those are two that are, are free, they take very little time, and they can really change our whole outlook of how we can feel more powerful in the classrooms to be ourselves. And I really suggest that teachers teach these to students so that they can do them also. Can you talk more about um, Don't Make Everyday Game Day? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is something that, um, so my husband is a is a teacher also, and he's been working as an instructional coach. And we try not to totally let teaching uh, flood into every part of our lives. So it's more around <laughs> dinner time. We tend to these days try to, to reflect a little bit. And we were both noticing the extreme amount of pressure that the teachers we were working in were feeling. Like every single time somebody um, would ask them something, it, was, it felt like game day, like the championship game. Um, and like what it's like, I mean, we're, we are both athletes ourselves. Like I played soccer in college and, you know, there's a reason why there's practice days and scrimmage days and game days. 
And no team, no matter how good you are, could possibly play their best with the pressure of every single day making a game day. That you have to have those days to like muck around and try something and let it be light and fun and like, no, it's probably not going to go well. And I think teachers are always, um, teachers are often, I don't want to say always, are often sent the message that every one of their school days has to be the game day. And the amount of pressure that builds up with that is really unsustainable. So I'm not suggesting that we like spend months of the year just like playing around, but we need to be able to have a playful attitude. So for example, I talked to a principal recently who's a courageous principal. And I said, so what are the things that you've learned this year? And she said, one of the things I've learned is when teachers take a risk and do something for one of the first times in a formal observation and then reflect with me on how it went, those are always the best observations. And I said, but what if it doesn't go well? And she said, oh, they usually don't. I don't expect Mm -hmm. them to go well. It's not about them going well. It's about trying something, releasing the pressure from being like perfect and doing the same old lesson you've been doing for the last 10 or more years. And instead, like this is a teacher who's willing to learn and be playful about it and then wanting feedback. So we need more administrators and leaders to, I think, send the message Um, But if you're not in a district with a principal like that, it's maybe just asking yourself, like, does today have to be a game day? Do I have to put that level of pressure? Because the students are the ones who are feeling that. That's right. It it becomes a trickle down that everyone is making every day game day. And then we wonder why we have mental health crisis in our country and, you know, extreme um, depression and anxiety. And I think a lot of it is the pressure that's unsustainable. And Often by simply just asking, does this need to be a game day? And the answer is often no. (laughs) Just lets us maybe take a sigh and and move into a more playful mindset about our work. I noticed that you use the word courageous there. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that I see a lot in your work. And and I love that because I think a lot of the things we've talked about today really do take courage. This is not necessarily the normal attitude in a lot of educational spaces. So your definition of what it looks like to be courageous has a couple different components. Can you share what that means to you? Sure. So I just want to say that too. I love this E.E. E. Cummings quote where she says, it takes courage to grow up and become who you really are. Mm, that's so good. And I think in some ways, like that's what I want for all people, but certainly for all teachers. I think there's this way in which we're you know, we maybe go to a teacher prep program that's anywhere from okay to amazing. I was lucky to go to an amazing one, but I still was thrown into a classroom and felt like I was sort of growing up to be like, what's the kind of teacher I'm going to grow up to be? And a lot of what I did was just compare myself to the teachers I had had and I admired. So could I grow up to be like Mr. Zach's, my third grade teacher, who was just like, totally the wackiest, silliest, but most memorable teacher I ever had, mostly because like he didn't have third grade expectations. He treated us like learners who were his uh, equals in a lot of ways. And he did things that were so unpredictable because that was who he was, not to entertain us, but to just, that was who he was. And he brought that into the classroom. So for example, I remember we knew he was taking karate classes because he was teaching us physics in third grade by showing us how he had just learned to break a board with his hand in a karate chop. And he let us try. Like some one of the kids, I remember like Joe or someone in my class was like, can we try that? And he was like, okay. <laughs> and, and I like talk about Mr. Zaxon here because he was really one of the most memorable teachers I ever had. And to me, it wasn't really the board or the karate chop. It was like, oh, like I knew what his passions were. I knew he was still learning himself and he brought that in. And he didn't then say no to our own um, passions and interests. So to me, like part of being courageous is like realizing like there are going to be many teachers who students don't remember their names. They don't like I have teachers when I think back and I'm 40 years old, almost 41 years old. So it's not that I'm that old, but I shouldn't remember their names, but I don't. And then there are teachers like Dr. Zatz who was like imprinted on me and So to me, part of being courageous is when you are yourself and like fully yourself and you bring that into the classroom, you are going to be memorable for your students and something positive is going to stick with them. Another way I think that we can um, 
be courageous. And this one is, I think, in some ways for me, really, really challenging is choose to be seen. And what I mean by that is it's really easy to hide behind our content or our curriculum or the policies of our school. But when we're choosing to be seen, we're choosing to let our students know that like we are not perfect, (laughs) that we ourselves struggle with things, that we have our own self-corrections to make. And I won't get into all of the details now, but I, I really open the chapter about being courageous with probably one of the most vulnerable moments of my teaching career, where I was teaching um, college seniors at the time as a professor, and I was collecting some student work. And in one of the the notebooks I collected, a note was in there. And I read the note, and it was a note that was saying some offensive things being passed back and forth between two students about me. Like some really hurtful things that sort of, I went through a range of emotions, like how dare them, and... I was really angry and then I was really hurt and then I started to feel shame like I'm not good enough these kids don't like me and sort of all this sort of really I mean I even cried like it was really painful Mm. and I went home and I remember like venting to my husband about it like and I'm gonna tell her like this is unprofessional this isn't okay and luckily I gave myself some space because what I actually decided to do was I realized like like something is going on for her. If she's a 21 year old woman about to graduate and go be a teacher, passing notes, making fun of a teacher in her class, like what's going on and how isn't this class working for her? So instead I took a few days and I asked her to come meet with me and I put the note in front of her and I didn't yell at her and I didn't accuse her of anything. And instead I allowed myself to be seen. And I said, this really hurt when I read it, but I'm really interested in like, what's going on with you? Like, what's not working for you in this class? Because when I see this note, I, I'm seeing something is just not working. And by being vulnerable in that way and showing her that, like, this is an opportunity for us to have a discussion, she ended up opening up about, like, how stressed she was and how hard student teaching was. And we had this, like, really, really honest conversation. And we ended up, in a lot of ways, being closer than any other student that I had in that class because I choose to be seen with my feelings and my emotions, as opposed to sort of going into the role of authoritative professor and me going to tell this student that, you know, what they did was unacceptable. She knew it was unacceptable. I didn't have to, to lecture her about that or make her feel bad about it. I didn't have to put my shame on her. And so I share that story because I think there are so many moments in our career as teachers where we're feeling an emotion that's uncomfortable and how we chose choose to like be seen or not with that emotion is like a turning point. Um, and I get it that the developmental age of our students can have a really you know big impact. Like she was an almost adult, so I could have a different kind of conversation with her. But to me, like that's the true sign of of being courageous in a lot of ways is like owning what's ours and choosing to show up and let other people see it, because that's what we're then allowing um, our students to do. And that's really that last tenet sort of connects to that, like that to me being courageous is choosing to accept and choosing to accept ourselves and our students for who they are. Um, I know I mentioned Cornelius earlier. I was on a a planning phone call with him and some other colleagues last week, and we were really talking about this idea of loving our students. And we were really talking about how um, Bell Hooks talks about it. And I'm not going to get into all of that research now, but to me, like part of being courageous is like choosing the courage to accept and love ourselves and our students. And it almost feels weird to use the word love, yet I want to send my child to a school where he is loved every day. And I think that's a huge part of it. And we cannot give that kind of love and acceptance to our students if we don't have that for ourselves. So just to sort of summarize, like for me, three big parts of being courageous are being ourselves, which is going to be memorable, showing up for others to see us for who we really are, and then accepting and loving ourselves and others in the classroom. So those are three of the big parts. And it seems when I say it almost like you could roll your eyes, like really be seen and in, in love, but I don't think that's what's getting the attention in most schools right now. I don't think that's how most teachers are getting the messages that that's what's expected of them in the classroom. Yep, I agree 100%. 
What is something that you wish every teacher understood about teaching like themselves? So I think maybe like the obvious thing to that is like, that's the goal to teach like themselves. (laughs) These things that work for others don't have to work for you. So I think part of it is just like what your students need is you. You know, the Beatles were the Beatles because nobody else had ever been the Beatles. And there's going to be a lot of cover bands of the Beatles ever since, but we don't know those cover bands, right? (laughs) Like there's a way in which like everyone needs to be themselves because that's what's needed in the world. Uh, And yes, it's okay to sort of play cover songs at first. That's how we all learn. But ultimately, it's to hone our skills to be who we are. And I think that's just the most important message. And I hope that every teacher can find that sort of courage and self-love and support from at least one person to say like, yeah, I'm enough and I've got some gifts and talents to offer and I don't need to to fix or change myself to be an effective teacher. In fact, that might have the opposite effect. Well, I know one place that teachers can get that support and that ongoing encouragement, because these are mindset shifts. These are things that you can't just hear Mm -hmm. once. It's something that you really need to put into practice and hear on a recurring basis. And I know that one place they can get those resources is by connecting more with you. Where would you suggest someone who's listening to this go after this if they want to learn more or go deeper with any of these concepts? Great. So we do have a Facebook community, a Teach Like Yourself Facebook page um, with a few thousand members from around the world, um, which I'd love to grow even more. Um, So that's one space where you can connect with me, but also other teachers who are um, like-minded in this way. Uh, I do have a, a blog and I, I am on Twitter and because I have a toddler, it's a little sporadic, <laughs> but I would probably say, um, to follow me on Twitter at Dr. Gravity G, um, on Facebook. And then, you know, the, the book is the kind of book, to be honest, I've reread this book more than any book I've written multiple times and done the reflection exercises myself multiple times. So I also think if you're looking for some coaching, um, and your budget is more like twenty dollars than you know hiring a professional coach. Then, you know, I also would recommend reading the book and, and using the exercises and getting one um, colleague to help uh, reflect with you on that. A big thanks to Dr. Gravity Goldberg for sharing her insights here today, and thanks to you for listening. Have a great week. You can do this, and remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.